Well, hello, everybody. Hope you're having a good time so far this uh, wonderful Saturday. And thank you for joining us uh, for our first uh, Intellivision Virtual Expo. Anyhow, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michael Hayes. I am the uh, owner of Midnight Blue International. And some of you may remember me from uh, 20 years ago when I had my website, the Intellivision uh, Library. Anyhow, uh, a few things that's been uh, cooking. I did create a few games, uh, particularly these past few years. You may have one of the first four uh, Intelligent Homebrews. Uh, mine was Same Game in Robots, which was published by, uh, I believe it was in, uh, Intelligent Vision. That was in, uh, released in December 2005. Anyhow, um, then there was uh, my prototype of FUBAR, which I did finally release just last year, which I'm very proud of. And uh, again, uh, thanks to Oscar's uh, wonderful uh, Inti Basic. And then uh, now, in addition to that, I did say that there was going to be a um, workshop I was going to host for a portable intelligent development environment. If anybody's interested in creating their own environment on their Android device, you can just get a hold of me, um, uh, just send me a chat, whatever, and just let me know, and then we'll work that out uh, sometime later. But uh, anyhow, uh, just go right into it. I'll show you some. Um, first of all, I want to talk about some of the games that have already been released that you may or may not know of. Um, so first I'm going to show you, now I have a front end which I put together. My website is midnightblueinternational.com. You can see uh, what I've got available there. The instructions to make your own portable environment are on that website. But first I'll show you now, let me just get this queued up. So first I'm gonna show you, I have a Blix and Chocolate Mine which was released last year by Good Deal Games slash Homebrew Heaven. Okay, here it is. Okay. Okay. So you should be able to see this just fine. Just uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to get started here. So what we see here is we have two games in Blix and Chocolate. Uh, so Okay, so just bear with me. I'm going to reopen my front end. I'm going to reopen the game. This time I'll share without the audio. I'm sure you've heard the music anyhow. Okay. No sound. Okay, here it is. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to Chocolate Mine. Okay, so now in this game, what's gonna happen, this is kind of an original idea. This is sort of a cross between uh, Dig Dug and Minesweeper here. Now you have the uh, happy face up at the top screen and you're trying to get down to the dollar symbol at the bottom. And the dollar symbol, as I had called it, is a shard of the one true signature piece. Now, the idea is that you're eating your way through chocolate. And what you're trying to do while reassembling the signature piece, you're trying to watch out for jawbreakers. 
that are hidden in the uh, chocolate. Now you'll see here on the sides, there's numbers. So this one that turned yellow, that's because we're two spaces away from a jawbreaker. Now we're one space away. So I'm gonna backtrack a little bit, deduce where it is, okay. So there's a jawbreaker right below me. We're going to avoid that and keep eating our way. And now the faster you get a signature piece shard, the more money it's worth. And you're gonna keep going. There's a total of 40 shards to find out there. And I have seen screenshots of some people that have, okay, we got two here. There we are. And now I'll just uh, kind of throw this one. You'll see that every two shards you get, there's another jawbreaker. Now instead of five, we have six now. Okay, let me find that one. I believe it's, there it is. Okay, so I hit that, that's the end of the game. And I got a high score now. This game does support JLP, meaning that your high scores are saved to the cartridge. Um, now, because I just uh, got this game on my PC off of my uh, tablet, of course, I don't have any high scores saved just yet. Oops, I meant to quit. Now, you can actually, one of the features of Blix and Chocolate that I haven't really advertised is that you can get out of a game, go to the other one, and then resume where you left off. But anyway, now back here, because there is new high score data, I'm going to tell it to save it to cartridge. Uh, but now moving on. Okay, next, now FUBAR is what I wanna talk about. A little bit of length. Okay. Again, I'll disable the sound. All right. And no sharing, all right. So here we go. <clears throat> so now here, here's FUBAR. And I did, just before our show here, I did create a save file. So I'm gonna go ahead and load that. But this one, I did wanna talk about in a little bit of length. Um, again, you may have seen the prototype from back in uh, 2004 when I wrote it. Now we have, now here's a little secret. I actually did not finish the game from that prototype. I actually rewrote it from the ground up. Uh, one thing is, again, this also uses JLP because it uses all three of the features of JLP that were advertised at that point. One was it uses extra RAM because I, one of the salient features uh, that when I first came up with the idea for FUBAR, the one feature that dominated everything else was I wanted eight AIs. And because of memory constraints without JLP, it's the reason I could only have four AIs before. So now there's eight. Uh, second thing is, of course, there were slowdown issues. So one thing I did was used the, I used uh, JLP's uh, real-time multiplication and division, which handled that issue. And then finally, it does also save to cartridge. Now, this way, because you can have all of your Okay, I thought I saved it. I guess I didn't. That's okay. All right, so right now, here's the default settings. You have one, two, three, four appears to be, uh, if you look in the far right, you have a synopsis of your players. Uh, the four players on the far right are bound to human players because I did enable ECS for four player action. Now, this would have been probably the first released four player game. Somebody beat me to that uh, with another game. But again, if you have an ECS, uh, the released computer expansion module with a pair of Intellivision 2 controllers, you can have four players at the same time. Now, if you look, five and six players are, they look like smiley faces. Those are AIs. Seven and eight, it appears like there's an X behind them. Those are disabled players. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through the settings. And again, you can save this to cartridge. So you don't have to go through and configure everything every time you play. You can save it to any one of eight save files. I'm going to set uh, player one is now an AI. Player two is now an AI. And the other thing you'll see is that you can reconfigure the AIs just as in the game Mind Strike. And from that point, then you can even put the AIs against each other. You can reassign teams. You can assign the color of the paintbrushes. Um, you can also assign starting positions. Otherwise, normally it's random. 
Yes. All right. So now we have six players bound to AIs. I'll activate these other two guys also. So we'll have all eight AIs. You'll see it going now. Again, I'll just mention last year, just after the game got released, we had a, a live convention in Syracuse, New York. That was um, it was Retro Game Con Seven, and I had this game going on my actual Intellivision unit on my uh, old TV, and it went the whole time uh, with no problems. So let's see here. All right, so right now I'm going to keep the default game mode, which is going to assign points based on the percentage of canvas. Uh, it's set to five rounds. I'm going to crank that down to two and not keep it going too long. Time will put it down to 45 seconds. Density's fine. Hyperspace charge, I'll probably lower that a little bit. All right. I'm going to tell it that I do want to save to a file, number one here. And off it goes. We're just going to let that go. It's all eight AIs. Now, if you look at the gameplay, there are seven different teams here. And your team is decided by what color paint you're painting on the canvas. Uh, player number six, if you find him, he's a gray paintbrush. He's actually a griefer. He's not bound to any one of the teams. He just goes around erasing everybody's paint. Now, the two here, you look at the timer. Two is how many rounds are left. And then you have the seconds. That's how many seconds are left in this current round. And then you have the uh, smiley face down there, which actually I had put in there in the prototype. And I just decided to leave them in. I thought it added a little bit of, uh, made it a little more uh, informal. So anyhow, we're going to see here. Now the round's about to end. This is how many points everybody got. That's the percentage. This is our total rounds. You see it accumulates the same way as in Utopia. We have one round left because I told it two rounds and that's it. So we're going to see what happens. See who wins. It may go into overtime if two teams are tied for the lead. And we're going to keep an eye on that. Okay. So again, we'll just see this through to the end here. Uh, we could have had teams. You'll notice that the AIs too, they will teleport away so we don't have two jostling each other. We also have obstacles, just as in Snafu. Again, hence the name Fubar. I was uh, trying to design a game that was inspired by Snafu here. Now, a couple things. Okay, we have, no, blue team wins. Got the most points, uh, 23 there. Uh, a couple things I'm going to talk about also before we move on about Fubar. One is that uh, for those of you who did already get a copy, you may have noticed that there were two different overlay colors. Uh, one of the announcements I wanted to make about FUBAR is that there are actually eight different overlays out there. You have the seven teams plus white for the griefers. Um, I haven't heard yet if anybody's collected all eight, but um, I do know of at least one person who has seven so far. If anybody's got all eight, let me know because I do want to brag about you on my website. Um, give you a little bit of a, a nod. Also, there are a handful of ultra rare silver overlays. I'd like to see if anybody does um, get any of the silver ones. A few copies out there. I do have them in. Also, uh, in, in each box, there's a registration flyer. Now, I'm not going to open this, but there's a registration flyer in the box. Um, with that, there's a code. You have a chance to register your copy. And for $5, just uh, for shipping, you can request an extra pair of overlays if you do have an ECS and you can play four players. So that's what I'm going to say about that. Again, if you already have a copy, do register it. I do monitor uh, the registration on my website back end. Okay, so anyway, that's enough about FUBAR. Now I'll go on to a few others here. Now, a couple other games, which I won't go into. <clears throat> There's, you may have seen, there was Hunt the Wumpus, which I wrote for the, for, um, for the 2018 anti-basic contest. And then I also have another game uh, soon to be released onto a cartridge. Uh, that's uh, Robot Finds Kitten, for those of you who are familiar with that. Uh, but now the new um, game that I want to show you. Now, some of you may have seen the uh, uh, preliminary announcement yesterday on uh, Facebook. Again, I'm going to have no sound here. OK. Bear with me. Yeah. 
opening my new game. Okay, gonna set to share here. Okay, here it is. So this is X-Ray and Dillagas. This is gonna be a good deal games release. So again, X-Ray. Now I'll just show you real quick live is that X-Ray was based on an old board game from the 70s uh, called Black Box, which I have a copy of. And I decided to make an intelligent game out of it. I liked it so much. Um, so again, that's not an original game. Dillagas sort of is. Uh, actually, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit reset here on the Intellivision window. You may notice this text here. Actually, again, I, that's uh, kind of a nod to uh, the game Clax. So I'm going to get right into it here. So we have two games. Again, there's Dillagas and then there's X-Ray. So X-Ray is the one I first set out to do. Now, it's a single player game that two people can play at the same time. There's, you'll see two instances. Now, some of the menu options down to the bottom, you'll see you can set your number of targets, four, five, six, or seven, and then you can select what music you want. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at four. So I'm gonna start the game X-Ray. Now here's what you see. The left side is um, uh, blue bordered and the right side is green bordered. Again, these are two instances of the game running at the same time that two people can just play independently of each other. I'll start with the left player. So you see here, there's um, here's a cursor. Now the way the game works is you have a grid and it's eight by eight. And then you have 32 entry points surrounding the grid and they're all numbered. And the idea is this. Now we have four targets. That's what I selected in the main menu. So there are four diffusers hidden somewhere inside of this grid. So what we're gonna to try to do is find those four diffusers. Now what happens is everything that's going on in the grid, you can't see. Uh, the way you're gonna find out where the diffusers are is you're going to fire uh, what are called discovery lasers. So I'm gonna start, I'll fire a laser here. And there's two ways you can shoot a laser. One is that you can type, you'll see it up here. I just entered one. You can type the number of the entry point that you want and then press enter, or you can move the cursor to what you want and then press the top action button. Anyhow, so we just shot. Now the timer started because uh, the game has started. And this one here tells us how many lasers we've fired so far. And you'll see here, there's now a solid red tile. What that means is we hit a diffuser somewhere. So the laser went into the grid and it didn't come back out. Now I'll keep uh, firing here. Okay, now what this means, you see there are two orange tiles with a matching uh, sort of imprint. Now. You have to understand how the lasers behave. When it comes, um, anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark this position. I'm going to take one of the balls up here at the top and I'm going to mark this saying, I think there's a diffuser here. The way it works is when a laser approaches a diffuser, if it's diagonally ahead of it, it's going to turn 90 degrees away from that diffuser. Now this one, we see a solid yellow tile, it reflected meaning it went back out the grid the same way it went in. That can either happen, like if in this case, it may get between where there are two diffusers positioned two spaces apart for each other. And if it tries to go between them, it has nowhere to go but back. Or there could be a diffuser on the edge of the grid. And if you try to fire right next to it, it has nowhere to go but back out. Now, the way I'm gonna know that for sure is if I fire here, 20, this one's also yellow, which means the, this is probably where this one diffuser's at. I'm going to finish this off and then move on to, okay, this one hit two. And you can see this one here at number one, probably hit this one. So moving on. So we're going to find these last couple here. Okay, so we have one over here. Because this laser uh, got to here, this diffuser caused it to bounce this way. So if this one's hitting, then we know it's going to be in one of these two positions. So let's see what happens if we fire at 26. This one also oh, hits this one, of course. This one reflex. So that means this last diffuser is probably here. Now I'm going to press the lower right button, S for submit, press enter, and I was correct. Uh, so now what happens if I go out, if I press lower left to get back at the menu, now you'll see 
my time and my number of lasers shot, this is the best time and best number of lasers for four diffusers. If I change my number of diffusers here at the menu, that record disappears because I haven't set a record yet for, um, for that many. But if I go back to four diffusers, there it is again. Okay. So now we're gonna go to Dillagas. I'll show you the um, two player mode first. What's happening is <clears throat> two people are competing against each other to capture bubbles and put them into their reservoir. Uh, so both players, if I use them, they both are jockeying for control of this uh, bouncing uh, silver zapper here. And you're trying to fill your reservoir by uh, hitting a bubble while it's over your color background here. You see it's partially black, partially white. The left player is a black reservoir. Okay, and just one right player is a white reservoir. It's as simple as that. There's four different backgrounds that's randomly chosen. If time runs out, it's a draw, um, but that's that. So moving on, just so I don't take up too much time here, I'm gonna go back to the menu. Here's a single player game. And another thing about single player game is that two people can also cooperate with this game. You'll see that using both discs and the disc, um, it does have uh, 16 directional movement. And right now, because number of targets is set to four, there's only four bubbles that I'm trying to capture. But every time you capture them all, you fill your reservoir, you gain a little extra time and you get a point. So the idea is get as many points as you can before time runs out. So now um, that's that and just keeps going. And your best time, I'm gonna uh, abort this, go back to the menu and we have our best score recorded here, three points uh, for this session. So that's X-Ray and Dillagas. Um, I have a few other games uh, going on here, but at this point I'm going to get out of here and introduce you back to my uh, lab here. So <clears throat> let's see. So I'm gonna check here, see if we have anything in the way of Q&A or uh, chat here, but <clears throat> okay. Okay, what do we got? Ah, Emacs, okay, yes. I'm glad somebody mentioned that because yes, I did notice that just the other day. Uh, funny you mentioned Emacs because uh, you'll see here on the uh, TV behind me, I'm mirror casting my actual development environment where I did build X-Ray and Dillagas, in fact. And let me open my front end. Now this front end, there are, um, in my environment, there are two front ends, one for development, one for um, uh, playing games. But what I'll show you is, oh yeah, so let me go into editing. I'm going to pull up Hunt the Wampus and I'm going to click the edit button. Okay, so now this is gonna open Okay, it reopens the front end. Okay, so yes, as you'll see, I am in fact using um, Emacs for development, but yeah, I did notice that uh, black box is available there. Um, let's see. Now, similarly, now my favorite game inside of uh, Emacs, in fact, was uh, Dunnet. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, a few others here, let's see. Ah, 3D version. <laughs> Very interesting. I hadn't thought of that either. Um, let's see. Okay, implement as a physical board game. Well, I certainly could. Um, I'll just show you my lab a little bit here. I do in fact have a, a 3D printer, which I had purchased a few years ago for the intention of making actual board games. You'll see on my website, again, my uh, website is, um, <clears throat> is uh, midnightblueinternational.com. But in fact, um, I know you won't be able to see this in the camera, it's uh, very dark, but you'll see that a couple of board games that I did work on, uh, they're using this 3D printer. I never um, had released them just yet, but yes, I could make a physical implementation of Black Box, I suppose. Um, a few other games I did get, which I put out there for, <clears throat> Um, which I know are freely available, which I did 3D print for family, make uh, excellent Christmas gifts. Uh, let's just grab a couple more at this point. Uh, it. Ah, <laughs> uh, somebody tried to uh, re-implement Dunnet. Nice. Okay. 
Well, anyhow, it looks like I'm being given the uh, one minute warning here. So anyhow, I'm just going to say um, thank you for joining me. And again, welcome to my lab. And I hope to uh, talk to you all again soon. Drop me a line. Um, you can get a hold of me through my website or on Atari Age or on IntelligentOnline.com. But that's all I have to say. So uh, thank you for joining us today and hope you have a good uh, uh, rest of the expo. Thank you.